Creo que el cojo de nosotros tiene. So I think we will. Bien. Bien. Qué desastre está. No, espera, pues nos ha caído el cable. No, 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 Uh, my name is Sara. I'm the president of the student chapter here in Madrid. So today we have the pleasure to have to introduce Professor Jean from University of Arizona. I want to thank the quick response, the accepting in the minute. So he was very kind in all the email and he, so thank I I thank thank you for that. So, Professor Jean is a professor in Wild College of Optical Science in the University of Arizona. His research is interesting are in optic, op ophthalmic instrument and lens design. His group has been highly active in, in building systems such as corneal tomographer, waveform sensor, retinal image, and design and testing multifocal and extended depth of focus intraocular lenses and contact lenses. He teaches course various optical engineer course including optic, uh, geometric optics and instruments and Fourier optics and Dr. Swickerly is also author of several books including five guides to visual optics and optical speci specification and fabrication and testing so thank you for coming and the stage is yours great thank you all right well good morning everybody and so first off let me thank you guys because um I've seen all the great research that's come out of here over, over the years, and I've been trying to get over here for many, many years in order to, to uh, learn more about, about you, and so I finally have the opportunity to be here, and so I'm really looking forward to uh, today. Um, so this morning, what I thought I um, would do is just kind of go through uh, some of the stuff that's, that I've been involved and tell you a little bit about uh, where, where I come from. So. Uh, I'm at the uh, Wyatt College of Optical Sciences. Uh, that's my office right, right there. And uh, it started off in the mid 1960s uh, with just this little building here. Uh, Roland Schack, uh, the Schack Hartman Wavefront Sensor, he was the first professor. He just uh, passed away about two weeks ago at the ripe old age of 92. Um, and uh, uh, from there, it just sort of blossomed into. Uh, uh, into a uh, very diverse uh, program in all area of optics. It was originally uh, funded by the Air Force to support uh, large telescope mirrors, uh, and uh, um, we'll, that's still kind of our, our uh, bread and butter uh, for a lot of things, but we've really expanded into you know, photonics and lasers and uh, biomedical uh, type stuff uh, as well. Uh, these are some of the large optics that we make. So uh, biggest that we can do is about 8.4 uh, millimeters. This is underneath the, uh, the football stadium. Uh, each one of these starts off as a whole bunch of chunks of glass about this big. Uh, and there's an uh, oven that they sit in and the entire oven can spin. And so they gradually heat up the, the glass. It melts and it starts to flow. And because it's spinning, it starts to uh, go up the edges of the, of the oven. And then they slowly cool off the glass. And when you're done, you have something that roughly has a parabolic shape. The nice thing about that is for a lot of these things, they're so big uh, that if you made it perfectly flat, you'd have to ex excavate uh, you know, a couple feet of glass in the middle of them in order to get the, uh, um, the proper, uh, proper curvature. Yeah. Uh, some of the other uh, projects that we've been recently involved with, this is uh, OSIRIS-REx. You may have heard, heard of this. This is a uh, spacecraft that uh, was sent out uh, to intercept an asteroid. Uh, 
and then uh, take a chunk of that asteroid and then send it back to uh, uh, to the Earth. Uh, and uh, last January, it, uh, uh, the spacecraft got to uh, got to the asteroid. Uh, so we built uh, this one called the Polycam, and so this is a uh, uh, the camera that you uh, get to see uh, pictures of the surface of, of the Swiss. Uh, in addition to that, uh, any of the pictures that you see from Mars most likely have been taken with cameras built at the University of Arizona. So this one is called High Rise. It's on a satellite that's orbiting around the uh, around the planet, uh, and then just uh, snapping pictures of the surface. Um, but we've also uh, built a lot of the ones on the on the rovers as uh, as well. A uh, couple projects that are currently ongoing right now with the big telescopes. Um, this is the main one right now. So this is the Giant Magellan Telescope. So it's a series of uh, seven uh, mirrors that are going to be assembled together to form one giant mirror that's 25 meters uh, in diameter. Each one of these uh, outer ones here is an off-axis A-sphere super hard to, uh, to fabricate um, and, uh, um, and very asymmetric. And so uh, it takes uh, several years to make each one of these. So I think they're on number four uh, so far and uh, still have you know, another six years or so to go. Uh, the uh, campus, uh, so we are um, publicly funded uh, university, so we have uh, about 40,000 students all together. Um, the College of Optical Sciences is uh, it's, uh, one of the colleges as part of the university, but only has one department, so the Department of Optical Sciences in it, and it consists of roughly about 500 uh, students. Uh, we have 35 full-time faculty members and uh, about 35 uh, people who are in other departments, but do optics types of stuff and then use our students teach our classes and that, that kind of stuff uh, Currently we have about 300 graduate students uh, Half of those are PhD half are masters um, And then uh, we've graduated uh, close to 800 PhD students uh, over, over our history And uh, recently uh, we got renamed the James C. Wyatt uh, College of Optical Sciences. Um, if uh, any of you have ever used a, a WICO interferometer, Jim Wyatt is the Y in WICO. Uh, and so he started that uh, um, back in the 1970s and then sold it in, in the 1990s. And he's started a few other uh, companies since then. It's been very, uh, uh, very successful. And so he donated about twenty million dollars a few months ago to uh, uh, to uh, uh, the, the college, and so we decided, well, for that we can at least put your name on the on the, on the side of the, the building. Uh, but what was nice about this was that he earmarked it towards hiring new faculty, and so he's not just replacing faculty, but he wants to grow uh, the program. So the plan is to hire about thirteen new faculty members over the next six years. So for those of you who are finishing up your PhDs soon and you want to pursue a life of academia, you know, consider, uh, consider uh, you know, applying uh, for some of these positions. We're looking at all levels, all different areas and, and that kind of stuff. So. All right, so enough about what uh, everybody else does. Uh, let's talk about some of the things that uh, I work on in my group. Uh, so uh, back in the late 1990s, uh, uh, we started off building uh, some Shack Hartman uh, wavefront sensors. So this is uh, our original uh, uh, prototype uh, system. And uh, this was before uh, there were any commercially available systems. Um, and so uh, it was really it was a very exciting time because um, you know the area was moving very very quickly and, and a lot of research going on, on in this area. Uh, we built a couple different variations on this theme. So uh, this is a handheld 
uh, version of it uh, with an open view. Uh, what scares me is that uh, this little girl is going to university next year, so uh, <laughs> uh, it's been it's been a while. So um, this one was particularly challenging. The Jack Hartman, not the not the girl. So uh, because you have now six degrees of freedom, you have a kid who's moving around behind this thing. You have an operator who's trying to to follow them. Um, and uh, we're recording video through this whole thing and every once in a while everything sort of lines up and you get a nice perfect image that you have to scan through minutes of video per person in order to find that one golden frame to, to do that. So um, and we use that on the uh, Native American uh, reservation outside of uh, Tucson. So that uh, population has extremely high levels of astigmatism in their eyes, so like six diopters of astigmatism. And so they're trying to understand where that comes from and when, when does it start to develop. And so uh, started off with teenagers and sort of slowly progressed their way back to smaller and smaller kids uh, to try to understand uh, the morphology of the, of the eye. Uh, another variation on this is the uh, uh, Shaq Hartman based uh, auto refractor. So this is just a a teeny little thing that has a, a fogging system in it, so a target that the person can look at, uh, and then the, the light source and, uh, and measurement system. And uh, um, so we basically cut out as much of the fat that we could from the, uh, from the Shaq Hartman wavefront sensor to uh, boil it down to just get, uh, be able to do uh, refractions uh, with it. Moving on to some other technologies, so we've developed uh, fluidic lenses, so this started about 10 years ago, uh, and so um, the idea has been around for, for quite a while. Uh, so the basic idea is we have a, uh, a holder with a glass plate on one side and a deformable membrane on the, uh, the other side, and you push and pull fluid in and out of the, the chamber in order to balloon up the uh, deformable surface. And so we started off with a spherical uh, type surface and what scientists get very uh, linear response uh, out of this type of system and so uh, we can change um, uh, through the various levels. Uh, uh, this is you know, six diopters of uh, change in power uh, with uh, relatively small levels of aberrations uh, introduced uh, uh, higher order aberrations introduced uh, into the system. In addition to the spherical system, uh, we've also done uh, cylindrical lenses. And so in this case, the, the one thing that changes now, instead of having a cir circular aperture, you have a rectangular type aperture. And so as the membrane deforms, it changes more in one direction than in the other direction. And so you start to get a, uh, a torque uh, type of effect. And we can stack two of these on top of one another, uh, rotated 45 degrees to, to one another. And what that allows you to do with the proper combination is you can get a cylinder power oriented in any orientation. Okay? And so if we combine this with the spherical lens, we can do sphere, cylinder, and axis in order to compensate for uh, the main refractive error of the eye. One of the questions that always comes up with fluidic lenses, and we kept getting them over and over again, is what is the effects of gravity on the fluidic lens, right? Does the thing sag and deform? And so we had an opportunity to fly on what's affectionately known as the vomit comet. And, uh, <laughs> and so this is an airplane that sort of goes up and does one of these types of things. And so when it's going like this, you experience weightlessness, and when it's going like this, you're pulling about two Gs, so twice the normal uh, gravity on Earth. And so we have the ability to basically run these lenses uh, under different uh, gravitational loads. And so I got to send one of my uh, students uh, onto the airplane here. So this is Carl, uh, and uh, um, he, uh, um, uh, ran the whole experiment here. Let me uh, run the video here. Hopefully. And so obviously this is on one of the down things. So 
So, so basically, what they're doing, it's all pretty automated, but basically, they're, they're running the, the lens through, um, through uh, different things. I love this guy over here. He's not one of ours, but, uh, but he's, not, he's not looking like he's feeling too well. So, so, uh, so the basic conclusion from this experiment was that there's so little fluid in there that, that gravity doesn't really affect things you know, uh, significantly. So. All right, so we have Shaq Hartman sensors, we have fluidic lenses. Next natural thing is to let's stick them both together and see what we can do with it. And so uh, this is a fluidic lens uh, for Opter. Um, and so this is one of the uh, first systems that we, uh, we put together. Uh, so we have a stack of uh, fluidic lenses here. So it's binocular system. So we have the sphere and two cylinders here. Uh, and the person can look through at an eye chart across the room. Uh, this is an infrared uh, light source, comes into the eye, scatters off, comes back through here, and there's a Shaq Hartman sensor over here. So we can measure the, uh, the wavefront uh, coming out of the eye as the person, person's looking. And then the idea is you take this information, you feed the pumps into the fluidic lens, and you try to null out the, uh, uh, the aberrations in the, in the system. I think this is a movie too. All right, so the eyeballs go down here. This is the measurement channel in the infrared, Shaq Hartman sensor, uh, and then that feeds uh, into the pumps for the fluidic lenses, and so you can uh, push and pull fluid out of here in order to change the power with the idea of nulling out the, uh, the aberration. And then once you know what the volume is of fluid that's in the, each one of those lenses, you can recover a, uh, a prescription from that. You know, sort of a uh, interface here. So um, basically it's just taking the Shaq Hartman information, turning it into wavefront, and then predicting how much you need to how much fluid you need to pump in the door to, to change it. Uh, one of the things we did with this system, because it's pretty uh, pretty bulky, uh, is that we were able to eliminate uh, a whole bunch of the optics uh, by using uh, holographic optical elements. And so uh, we were able to replace uh, telescopes and beam splitters in the measurement uh, path by a pair of um, bear, a pair of holograms, essentially. And so what's nice about these is that they're uh, sort of brag type rating. So the infrared uh, diffracts nicely and goes into the measurement channel. Uh, visible light goes straight through, so uh, the person has an unobstructed view. And so what this does now is it takes that whole system and sort of shrinks it down to now something that's about the size of a pair of binoculars. Okay. And uh, we recently spun this out of the university, uh, and uh, this company, ICRX, is uh, trying to, uh, to commercialize the system. Um, the idea is basically go into a, a place for spectacle prescriptions, automatically get measured, and then you can uh, get the, the glasses uh, dispensed uh, from there. Some other crazy things I've been involved in. Um, so uh, I've worked on multifocal contact lenses for a while, and uh, people came to me and said, I want to put a really high ad power lens in the middle of a contact lens, like a 60 diopter type type ad. And uh, you can kind of see it here, it's this, this bump, this wart on the, on the front of the, the contact lens. Uh, but what's cool about this is if you pick the shape right, uh, you can see underwater with them. And so, and it's only about a millimeter in diameter, so if you're above water, the light going in around this uh, is sufficient for you to see. You don't really notice anything from uh, that ad lens because it's so blurred out uh, that it essentially uh, becomes uh, non recognizable. So now, now you have uh, contact lenses where you can be above water or below water uh, and, uh, and see both of those. And uh, we tested this out 
So uh, this is our test subject here. Notice no no mask here, uh, and he's reading a, a reading chart here at uh, uh, 2020. And this is a uh, you know 70 year old guy, so there's no accommodation or anything uh, going on here. 2016. Uh, at distance underwater with, with these types of plants. And that led to another thing, similar idea. Hey, let's put a 60 diopter lens in the middle of a, a contact lens. Uh, but this is for a little different thing. So 60 diopter lens lets you focus on the inside of your spectacle lenses. And so uh, this company, Innovega, uh, uh, is making a system, uh, a basically AR, uh, VR type system, where instead of having the, that brick in front of your face, um, they are uh, just putting the displays on the inside of spectacle lenses, and then you wear these contact lenses uh, in order to be able to focus on that. And consequently, this dramatically reduces the size of the, of the system that, uh, that's required in order to have the immersive experience. Uh, there's a couple things in here. So there's the uh, ad power and there's a couple of uh, polarization filters that are embedded into the, uh, uh, into the middle of the, uh, of the contact lens. And what this allows you to do is to uh, have the display polarized and you orient the lens so that uh, there's a polarizer here that just lets light from the display through. This gives you a much brighter uh, apparent display uh, because you're blocking all the ambient background illumination. And then outside of that region is a polarizer that blocks all the light from the display and just lets the ambient illumination through it. So you get very high contrast uh, images uh, with this type, type of setup. They're sort of moving towards uh, Sort of this format uh, for the display system, and what's really exciting about this: 120 degree field of view. So something, something like this. If you ever tried on one of these systems, it's sort of like, like here, and you're sort of, sort of looking around, trying to uh, see the world around you. Here, this is this is much more immersive uh, type of system. All right, um, some uh, other things uh, interested in uh, simulating uh, a lot of different uh, situations. And so uh, this allows you to sort of rapid prototype various uh, different designs. And uh, we want to make the simulation sort of as realistic as, uh, as possible. And so if you go into ZMAX, uh, they have a simulation type thing, but it's it's not really uh, what I sort of envision. So if you uh, plot the point spread function uh, at different points in the field, you know it changes, aberrations get worse as you get towards the edge of the field, and you can take this information and you can sort of take an input image and you can blur it uh, with that information. But fundamentally what this is assuming is that this entire scene is flat. Okay? And so all they're basically doing is uh, taking this point down here and replacing it with the corresponding point spread function and doing that over and over for the entire, uh, entire scene. But the real world has depth to it. And so uh, we're interested in trying to simulate three-dimensional uh, scenes uh, in order to understand uh, some of the different optics that we develop. So one way to do that is to cheat, use uh, Photoshop, and just kind of fuzz things out uh, at different distances here. Uh, problem is it's not really optically uh, correct, um, but uh, it gives you an idea of like, oh, if this is blurry and this is sharp and this is sharp, then you probably have some sort of, of uh, intermediate vision, but no, no near vision. And so we want to be more accurate uh, in these simulations. And so uh, set up just some simple experiments to start off with, just a uh, series of letter E's, all the ang same angular subtents, but at different distances from the camera here. And uh, you can photograph uh, scenes at these, uh, these different depths here. 
And then you can measure the point spread function at each one of those planes, and then locally blur each one of these planes individually with their corresponding uh, point spread function. Uh, you have to worry about occlusion, so uh, things in front of other things block the blurred light coming from the thing behind it, so we got to uh, come up with some way to handle that. And so for this uh, simple case, uh, here are the two point spread functions at, uh, at two different planes, and basically we just cut out where we know the 1E is and blur this with the corresponding point spread function, and then take the other E that would go here and blur it with its point spread function, and then put the two together in order to, uh, uh, to get that. So relatively simplistic, uh, but it works pretty well for um, for certain, uh, you know, for certain scenes. So uh, this is the actual image with the camera, and this is the simulated image. We didn't bother sim simulating the uh, optical posts here. Uh, but you can see you kind of get the occlusion on the level of uh, blur that you'd expect. And then as we change uh, the plane of focus here, this is sort of mid-focus now, and then uh, far focus. And you can see that the simulation sort of follows what you'd expect to see for those, those different distances. From here, we can jump to more complex scenes, uh, but we're still going to make some approximations here. So this scene now is a uh, uh, window, um, uh, so distance uh, material, a computer intermediate, and a cell phone for near. and. Uh, we're assuming that each one of these are plane at a fixed distance. And then you can blur each one of these scenes with uh, their respective point spread function for those distances, and then again, sandwich them all together to uh, get something uh, that uh, is realistic. Here's the occlusion issue. Uh, we can see, so we can see in the foreground here, like this woman's shoulder, uh, it's blurred out, but the stuff behind it can kind of pass through that blur uh, and still be seen. And so uh, the way that this is modeled is that uh, her physical shoulder is, is opaque, and then any blur that comes off of that now becomes progressively more transparent, uh, thus being able to let stuff from uh, behind uh, through. And so that looks something uh, like this, um, and this sort of has the uh, uh, black here would be the sort of background, and then there's a transition at the edges here where there's some transparency to uh, the physical uh, cell phone that's, uh, that's shown here. And if we uh, snap these all together, uh, we can now start to simulate different things. Uh, so this is... Uh, focus at the distance uh, with no accommodation, and then this is uh, basically focused on the air, so you're wearing your reading glasses, uh, but everything behind it now is, is, uh, is fuzzed out. And of course, we can... Um, oh, and then this is... Uh, sort of monovision type of thing. So one eye is corrected for distance, one eye is corrected for near, and then you uh, take a very simple model of this, you just superimpose the two images on top of one another uh, to kind of simulate uh, what's happening. And what you can see is you get dis distance information, near information, but there's kind of this fuzzy glow over uh, everything from the out of focus image being superimposed on top of that. Uh, and then we can, of course, do this for many different images. This is a uh, bifocal contact lens. And so now we can sort of mimic the person kind of hunting around for the sweet spot uh, here. And there's one little spot in here where the, uh, the letters become kind of re readable. But distance and intermediate is pretty good, near vision. Pretty, uh, pretty so-so. Um, 
this is a different uh, type of contact lens that has a better uh, better near performance and so uh, the letters are more readable sort of in that uh, that uh, intermediate range there. All right, so but we're still making approximations here. We're approximating each one of these things as a plane here. Let's try to uh, push this a little bit further. Uh, and so what can we do? Um, so I was looking at uh, using uh, the light field in order to, um, to simulate uh, scenes. So light fields basically I have a point in space and I know every direction, color, intensity, uh, that ray that's passing through uh, that point. So in theory, if I know that everywhere, I can simulate a scene because I just collect all the rays that are passing through that point that are relevant to my situation and do that. That's a little challenging to do all that, but we can uh, simplify it a little bit. And so you can think about this point in space and just there's rays passing through them. And so for every single point, you have a uh, trajectory uh, for all the rays uh, passing through here. And we can use that to uh, try to understand the system. Um, there's common ways that we can represent uh, the light field. So probably the most common is something called two-plane parameterization. You can think of this as uh, the exit pupil of your optical system and uh, a camera sensor and we're looking at a single pixel on that sensor and so uh, a pixel on your camera sensor is basically taking all the rays from your pupil and integrating them together to come up with a single number and that's the output of the uh, of the pixel and obviously you can repeat that for uh, every pixel in the scene here. So I wanted to get to more complex uh, type scenes. Uh, so I started using a software called uh, Blender. This is a free and open source uh, program for rendering three-dimensional uh, scenes. And so all these things that you see in the movies and, and that kind of stuff, you basically put in geometries and material properties and light sources and then it chugs and comes, comes up with an image of that three-dimensional scene from the perspective of a camera uh, that, you, uh, um, that you define. Problem with this is that it is basically assumes a pinhole camera. And okay? so there's no aberrations. Um, it doesn't care how far things are away. It's just tracing one, way, one ray for every point in your image and tracing it all through the scene figuring out what it uh, uh, hits. And so I'm gonna take this and sort of um, hijack it and try to make, uh, uh, try to make it uh, more optically uh, realistic. And so um, started off with the scene. This is a free scene uh, that I found online and uh, maybe you guys recognize this. There's some of this one. This is from uh, Barcelona, uh, Barcelona Pavilion, um, and so um, it's a uh, architectural wonder, I guess, <laughs> uh, there. And so this is the, the real house, and then this is the, uh, the simulation from, uh, uh, from the software. And you can see it's pretty, pretty complex. You can define where the sun is to get different times of days. You can move the camera anywhere around in this three-dimensional space in order to see this from, uh, uh, from different perspectives. And so how can, we, uh, how can we make this more optically accurate? Well, the idea is that uh, we can set up an array of cameras. And so uh, I set up um, 625 cameras based on a 25 by 25 array covering about a 50 centimeter or 50 millimeter square um, region out here in the middle of the, the pool. And so these are just showing a few of the different images. And so each one of those pinhole cameras is capturing an image from a slightly different uh, perspective. Okay? And you can think of this is if I have a ray uh, passing through 
uh, one of these pinhole cameras and it might strike uh, some point over here, I know what the value, uh, the intensity, the color value of, of that one. And for a different ray passing through that same pinhole camera, maybe it strikes over here and I can uh, get a different color value. So now I know, depending on what angle I'm coming into this pinhole camera, I know what information it's, uh, it's carrying. Uh, I first tried to do this a couple of years ago on my uh, office computer, and so it took uh, a really long time and low resolution. Okay? These, are, these are not fast uh, cal calculations, but what's nice is that there are these render farms now. And so you can literally take your model, upload it to the internet, and for about $100, you know, 10 hours later, you can download these 625 high resolution images uh, that have just been cranked through a bunch of servers at, uh, at this uh, uh, render farm. So to try to understand how this works is, let's think of an optical system and we're gonna trace it backwards. So we start at the image plane here and we have a single pixel uh, on our sensor here and we trace a bunch of rays out to the exit pupil of the system and because of aberrations in your system these rays are not going to come out perfectly parallel to one another so they might be pointing in different directions so trace this get all these rays now but now if I flip these rays around in the other direction each one of these rays is going into one of those pinhole cameras in the array and then I can just pick out the points in each of my individual images that correspond to uh, the respective pinhole camera and I sum all those up and that's my value for the single pixel in the image and then you repeat that for all the different uh, all the different pixels and just some examples here um, we can uh, write the uh, wavefront coming out of this optical system now uh, there's some tilt terms uh, which basically compensate for where you are in the field and then uh, your standard uh, wavefront error which would be your uh, output from um, Zmax you know, or aberrations or Mickey's however you want to do that side else uh, this one's just looking at a couple different uh, aperture sizes so this is basically just perfect lens change the aperture size and so what you expect to see is a change in the depth of focus associated with the uh, with the scene and so in this case this is the large aperture and you can see here that the stuff in the foreground is blurrier than the stuff in the background and if I uh, make the aperture smaller now I get this depth of focus uh, throughout, the, throughout the scene here Adding some more aberration, so this is just a defocus now. So I'm, I'm intentionally adjusting the focus on the camera lens in order to, to see. And what we expect is that, that the, we see that what's in focus will shift uh, in this, this example here. And so focus at infinity, stuff far away is in focus. So this is blurry, uh, but now I'm focusing at a plane about three meters away which is about where this uh, uh, light is. And so this now becomes sharp and the stuff on either side of it uh, becomes blurry. I, uh, let's see, this is field curvature. So basically if we can just define the aberrations of the system, we can plug it in. What's nice about this is once you do that initial calculation of all the different pinhole images, that's the hard part, but you only have to do that once. And then if you want to look at different aberrations, different things, you just plug that aberration in and it will spit out an image that uh, uh, has those aberrations. So this is field curvature, so you can think of this as defocus that changes as you go out in the field. So center of the field is sharp here and it gets progressively blurrier uh, towards the edges here. And then one of the things that makes total sense when you see it but you wouldn't see in like a 2D simulation with ZMAX is that this really near 
uh, light is in focus, right? Because what's happening is that the, the wavefront is, is curving up, and so it happens to be at this point, it's actually in focus and stuff like that. With a 2D type of simulation, you would just have sort of this uniform blur around the outside, regardless of the, the depth in the, of the scene. Uh, distortion is basically uh, tilt that changes as you go out into the, the periphery here. And the simulation now takes our nice structure and you get this little curve, pincushion type curve to the uh, to the roof line here uh, that you expect to see with the uh, distortion. So uh, to wrap up, the uh, majority of my research has been eye-related uh, type stuff, but it's kind of led me in uh, different directions over the years. Uh, more recently, I've been interested in sort of aberration theory, uh, freeform optics, uh, planoptic imaging. Um, and uh, so it's let me uh, kind of go and explore different things. Uh, over the years, I've graduated 16 PhDs and thir or 20 master's students. Uh, as far as I know, they're all gainfully employed, so that's a, that's a good sign. Um, and I currently have uh, three PhDs and three master's students and an undergrad working in my lab on these various projects. So, thank you. All right, questions? Yeah. We will have time for questions, and we, I remember that we are in streaming, so all the people are connecting in streaming, they have the opportunity also to, to ask their question in streaming. No? There is a little delay, so maybe they need to Jim, uh, very interesting. I, I do have a question on your foropter. Um, yep. So, so you have you have a way to 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 measure the aberrations, and then you recreate the correction on the freeform, uh, on the on the uh, spherical lens, mm -hmm. on the fluid lens. Yeah. Um, I understand as a way to test that the refraction that you got out of the Harman Shack system is correct. And, and uh, perceptually is, uh, is, the, is the description that the person needs. Is it how it works or is it the other, the other way around? So I, ideally, the minimum best prescription is, is the one that's, uh, that the person will tolerate. But in reality, what we know is some people like to be a little nearsighted and mm -hmm. um, they adapt to different things. And so uh, most likely the way that this is gonna work is it will snap in what it thinks your prescription is, and then you have a couple knobs that you can fine tune a little bit in order to, uh, uh, to optimize it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the initial prescription is taken then from the Harman Shack? Um, uh, that and, and or the fluid, uh, the amount of fluid that's <coughs> in the lens. And so uh, it turns out that that's pretty uh, monotonic relationship between the amount of fluid and the, the power that the lens is doing. Mm -hmm. And is that lens commercially available, or not commercially available? So, uh, so uh, this company licensed it maybe six months ago, and they're mm -hmm. sort of still in startup mode, trying mm -hmm. to get investors and, and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But um, they're talking with like a big uh, internet lens uh, distributor, mm -hmm. and so the idea there is basically they have sites around major cities where you can go in. You know, get measured, and then they FedEx you your glasses the next mm -hmm. day, something, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. they already have a model like that, but they have to have a person there that actually does the, mm -hmm. the refraction. Mm -hmm. so. And the fluid lens, how it compares with, uh, for example, the Opto Tune or the um, what's the other? I mean, there's another company. That yeah, so we we compared it to Opto Tune. And we found that the opportunity was a little more yellow, mm -hmm. um, and that it also tended to have some more uh, aberrations for larger mm -hmm. pupil sizes. Um, the downside for the ones I showed you, the downside for those is that they're relatively uh, small or slow, and so we actually had mechanical pumps pushing and pulling fluid out, and we're talking seconds to get mm -hmm. a lot of fluid in there. So. 
but the latest design actually has uh, uh, two membranes. So one is the optical membrane and then a second membrane. And you just push on this membrane, the fluid mm -hmm. goes over and, mm -hmm. and pops mm -hmm. this, this one up. Mm -hmm. And when you release it, it can, mm -hmm. can go in the other direction. And so that one is basically as fast as you can push and pull. It just, you know, it's hertz, kilohertz. Yeah. Thank you. It was a very interesting stuff. Uh, first question is for the, uh, the amphibious species. Yes. Uh, uh, are there the contact list, the contact available in the market? Uh, not on the market, but again, there's a company that's interested in trying to do it. Those were uh, scleral lenses, so yes. they're, they're rigid material, and they work great. Um, but they degrade over time. We put some salt water and learn that. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, they're trying to go to uh, PDMS, which is a, a soft material, uh -huh. um, and they're having problems uh, reproducing the power with that. And what I think the problem is is that some of the water is actually infusing into the, the polymer and changing the refractive index. And so people are coming up hyperopic basically when they when go underwater and it's, it's and not. The centration should, should be critical. Yeah, so with the with the scleral lenses, uh, centration is actually fairly uh, fairly easy. Um, and then with the new material, they're, they're large, they're 14 millimeter lenses. And so if they're fit properly, you can get them to, to center uh, very well. Um, but like I said, there, there's other, other problems with that. So, um, but I've had free divers, contact me, I've had Navy SEALs uh, contact me, I've had water polo people contact me, because they're all, they all want this capability, so uh -huh. to not, not have to wear goggles and just uh, just be able to do it. So, so there is a market there, I don't know how big the, how big the market is, so I'll let, I'll let the business people <laughs> figure that out, and we'll just do the whole thing. Because they also serve as, as eye protection, I mean, I yeah. guess the goggles have uh, to, to Objectives, right? One is uh, to produce vision, and yeah. the other is to uh, to, to protect. To give from... you some protection. Yeah. But yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, so I had a yeah I had a student who uh, um, she was a water water polo player, mm -hmm. and so they are extremely vicious <laughs> athletes. <laughs> yeah. You don't realize what's going on sort of under the surface in in one of those games and stuff like that, and so. Um, but she thought that if she had, you know, this type of thing, that it would give her a competitive advantage over all the other people. And like you said, if somebody's, you know, gashing at your eyes, it's not going to do anything. So, and the second question I have is for in the uh, photo extractor. Yep. Uh, you use the, the Sahama. Yeah. Um, what do you do to avoid the the uh, the cornea reflection? So in that case, typically what we do instead of coming straight into the cornea is we decenter about one millimeter, and so the corneal reflection tends to go off in a in a different direction. But, but, but not but, for everybody. So. It, yes. Uh, what happens in that case if the eye is, for instance, my up is too long? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if you go out, uh, you go one millimeter up. From this, out of the center, yeah. and then we will cut and will not get maybe the, the, right the, the aberration from the focus. Yeah. So we are getting maybe some some extra defocus astigmatism that this should that not be should there. not not necessarily be there. Yeah. No, I I would agree with that. So, and um, you know, I think you'd have to have you know the higher levels at both ends of the, the spectrum would be be harder. So, and you definitely see a nonlinear effect. There's, there's not, you know, the curve kind of goes like this as you're changing the, the power versus the, you know, what's predicted with the check card. It would be a nice linear response, but it's actually got some sort of curvature to it, and that might be the source of it. So. Yep. In your depth scene, uh, where is the image simulation? I didn't quite understand that you have to create that line field for several different uh, pinhole points. Yeah. And after that, you can simulate any aberration, including depth of focus, or... Yeah, so the so the, the, basic, the basic technology is to... Um, So 
slowly. All right, so basically I pick a place in, in the scene and uh, here I've picked a 50 millimeter by 50 millimeter patch sort of at this location and I have uh, 625 pinhole cameras in that area. And so as long as my camera, no matter what the aperture is, aberrations, fits within that 50 millimeter square region, it can be simulated with those those images. It, you can look in different directions. You can um, you know do a, a long focal length, short focal length, change up the focus, uh, you know crazy aberrations and, and that kind of stuff. But if I want to go over here, I got to redo sure. the, those types of things. That's the slide in the hand that you could see at the start. Is that within those 50 millimeters? Or yeah. Not? Yeah. So. Uh, so in here, I'm just basically, um, yeah, so for this one, I'm just running across one row of, you know, so 25 different perspectives of that scene within that, that little patch here. So, um, so it's, it's kind of a cool, cool little thing. Um, the, you know, the computing power is just catching up to, to, you know, what we're trying to do here. So. Uh, two years ago, these were 256 by 256, and, uh, which is not enough resolution to even start to see some of the stuff. These are sort of one megapixel type types of images that uh, um, can show you some of the effects that, that we're interested in. And the clinical idea behind it is to be able to tell a patient what you see. With yeah, the so, so this particular one was just a generic camera but the idea would be come up with a scene kind of like the office scene that, that we showed with the cell phone and the computer and the distance and stuff like that and you know Mrs. Jones if you wear this lens this is you know this is what you can kind of expect to see and give them a realistic sort of feeling as to how the different depths uh, actually actually play out so, and the side effects associated with the, with the lens and stuff. Yeah. Last question about the what is different question about the optical system or the big mirrors for the telescope. Yeah. How do you measure the surface, the curvature of the surface of the uh, is it around twenty five meters, the diameter or Yeah, it's it's uh, pretty high. So um, so in our in our building we can only do the small mirrors, which are up to about six meters. <laughs> and then, uh, and so those mirrors are made uh, in the basement, and so that's the basement's actually uh, three stories underground, and then we have a tower that goes all the way up to uh, the seventh floor, uh, so seven stories, and up there you can put a laser and um, basically just you know shine it down like a typical fizzo. Uh, type of thing and measure the, the curvature of, uh, of the system. Um, and then uh, underneath the football field, that's where they do the big mirrors, they have a similar type, type of setup. So that one's even, even uh, more uh, complex because they have the interferometer on the ground and it goes up and it hits a, uh, a mirror about this big and then goes down onto the, onto the, the real mirror that they're, they're testing. So we have 15 people connecting, and one of the person has a question. Elena Duran from Martinovi, mm -hmm. contact lenses company. Have you measured aberration in fluid lenses, and are they spherical aberration free? Uh, they're not spherical aberration free, but it's relatively small, especially for the aperture sizes that we're using. So the lenses that I showed there, uh, the apertures are about uh, 25 millimeters. But we're only using roughly the central six millimeters or so, um, and what that does is, is ba basically you get some sort of aspheric shape coming out of that. But you're only picking off sort of the central spherical region. Of that. Do you have another question? No. A lot of thank yous. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and they are so impressive about the gravitational force. Uh -huh. So. There are no questions in the public. So we can thank Professor Jim again. Okay. I want to thank also Carmen and Clara for the streaming, and the in charge of the streaming, and Carmen and Victor who are in charge.
charge to contact Professor Kim and arrange the event. And now we will have a coffee break upstairs, so we can continue with talking and the talking. Yeah. So all of you are invited. So we can go upstairs.
So uh, now we will continue with the second part of the seminar. So Professor Tim uh, will give us a, a workshop in, in design and testing in the focal and student of the focus uh, lenses. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, and if you guys have questions during this, please you know stop me and, and ask. Let's make this uh, interactive. So, um, so I want to talk about you know multifocal and extended depth of focus uh, type lenses as they apply to uh, to the eye. And uh, really, what we're trying to um, to uh, solve here uh, is. Uh, the uh, problem of accommodation. So the way that the eye works is, is the crystalline lens inside the eye is flexible when you're young. And uh, so if we put something up close, it can change shape. And let's focus on here. And if we want to look the back of the room here, we can relax the muscles in our eye and the lens flattens out and uh, um, we're in focus there. Unfortunately, as we get older, uh, we lose this ability. So the lens becomes stiffer and harder, and you need longer and longer arms in order to, uh, to see stuff. And most of you in here are pretty young, and this seems like something that that is way off, and it's something your parents deal with and stuff like that. But it will sneak up on you, and it will get you. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so uh, if we look at the uh, um, look at the typical range of accommodation here, uh, infants can focus on stuff that's about uh, this far from their face. And as you get older, it slowly starts to get further away. And when you get into your uh, 40s and 50s here, it's kind of where you want to hold the uh, hold the menu or the book or or the iPad, I guess, these days. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, it's, uh, you just can't exert enough force on that lens in order to do it. And so um, multifocal and extended depth of focus lenses are really designed to try to treat uh, that effect. And so come up with a way in order to enable people who can't focus up close anymore to, uh, to focus up close. And um, the way that you typically do this is you put multiple powers into uh, the same lens. Okay? And so you want a lens that has two or more powers uh, across its, uh, its aperture. And there have been all sorts of variations on shapes and sizes and techniques uh, for doing this, both refractive and diffractive, uh, A-spheres uh, and, uh, and the like. Um, and it's been tried in both contact lenses and intraocular lenses or IOLs, uh, which are implanted uh, into the eye. All these techniques rely on simultaneous vision. And so uh, with simultaneous vision, basically uh, the one power in the lens is uh, providing a nice crisp image on the retina. And at the same time, the other power in the lens is putting a blurry image onto the retina on top of it. And so if I'm looking at the back of the room here, the distance portion of my lens makes a nice sharp image of that, but the near portion is creating a blurry image of that, that scene. And then when I look at something up close here, the two zones uh, basically have the opposite effect. So I'm always dealing with some sort of degradation uh, in the image in order to do that. And uh, I want to gain something uh, from that. And what I gain is with the multifocal lens, um, well, let's start with the single vision lens. Uh, let's say for distance, sharp, crisp, high contrast text here. Uh, but if I had the same text up close and I can't accommodate, uh, this just uh, blurs out and I can't read it. With a multifocal type of thing, I give up some contrast because I'm superimposing this in focus and out of focus image. Uh, but what I gain is that I get uh, something where I can read, but again, uh, that image is, is degraded uh, somewhere. 
And then the magic of designing these types of lenses is how do I maximize what I get from it and try to minimize the side effects associated with it. Uh, sort of the early uh, type lenses uh, to, uh, to do this uh, took a very simple approach and you can think of this as uh, basically cookie cuttering out uh, different sections of this lens and so we have alternating powers uh, as we go through the different regions of the lens here. And so the center here and uh, this ring and this ring might be for distance vision and the other rings may be for, uh, for near vision. And uh, there's a couple of commercial lenses that came to market from that. It's kind of what it looks like implanted into, uh, into the eye. Uh, but lots of uh, halos associated uh, with this type of thing. So you tend to look at a bright point source, see these big bright rings uh, around uh, those light sources that people didn't like. And we can think about this as, as the light passes through the lens, uh, you'll have one zone with a given curvature that will focus to one point and another zone with a different curvature that will focus to a different point. And so you're just alternating between uh, these two curvatures in order to get, uh, uh, to get the energy there. This technique is largely uh, defunct uh, in terms of intraocular lens implants, uh, but uh, there's still some examples of contact lenses uh, that use this, uh, this type of uh, uh, strategy in order to provide multifocal vision. And I should qualify everything here, so I'm basing a lot of my stuff on what's available in the US and uh, in the EU there's a wide array of, of stuff that uh, is available, so um, I'm sure that you guys know about more more types of technologies that might be available that, that use this type of thing. Uh, another type of refractive multifocal or sort of sector-based uh, lenses, and so in this case, uh, typically uh, half the lens is used at one power and the other half is used at a different power and there's sort of a smooth transition zone between uh, these two. And so if light goes through the top of this lens, it focuses at one distance and through the bottom of the lens it focuses at uh, a different distance. Uh, a couple of uh, IOL manufacturers uh, for this type of lens uh, and they seem to be getting fairly good, good results with, with that point. An alternative to uh, refractive type lenses are uh, diffractive uh, type lenses and uh, the two original ones uh, were from 3M, the people who make the post-it notes, uh, and a company called Pharmacia. And this one sort of evolved into the uh, Alcon uh, Restore uh, type of family. Uh, and this one is the uh, uh, Technus uh, type family, if you're familiar with the, uh, with the different uh, uh, types of lenses. But on here, there are little uh, steps in uh, the surfaces here. And so a lot of times I'll have people go, oh, it's a Fresnel lens. Well, a Fresnel lens is actually a big lighthouse lens. Okay? And uh, they're designed basically to uh, get light out into the ocean and, and try to collimate it as best as, as possible. Um, these types of lenses, uh, they have steps. The steps get progressively closer to one another, uh, but the height of these steps only about a micron, two microns, uh, and it's on the order of the wavelength of light. And so as light passes through here, it picks up these shapes and you get a, uh, um, a diffraction pattern uh, from that structure. And as that diffraction pattern propagates, light starts to interfere with one another and it ends up creating multiple uh, focal points uh, downstream from it. Here's a, a few other uh, variations on here. Uh, this one is called an apodized uh, diffractive, and so it has the steps, but the steps sort of fade out as you uh, move towards the periphery. And then in the periphery, uh, 
So you have a completely smooth refractive uh, type lens here. Uh, and the idea there was, was sort of uh, in bright lighting conditions when you want to have distance and near vision, uh, you know, small pupil and you're only using a small portion of this lens, but as the pupil opens up in the dark, you don't want to read. And so this refractive portion tends to bias towards distance. One of the drawbacks to these lenses is people want to read in the dark. And that was one of the feedbacks from, from patients is like, hey, I like reading in dim lighting conditions, so I don't like this uh, so much. All right. For the diffractive lens, um, um, the light comes through, and a given wavefront is actually broken up into, uh, into pieces. And, and depending on the heights of these steps, uh, tells you where this uh, wavefront is relative to the one in front of it and the one behind it. And so if we pick this height so that this one floats all the way back to the next one here, uh, we end up getting what in optics we traditionally call a diffractive lens. And all the energy ends up going into a single point here. If we pick these heights so that this piece was up with its neighbors here, that height would be zero and it would just look like a refractive lens and all the energy would go into uh, this focus here. But if we pick these heights somewhere between those two, uh, and so this piece is floating forward or backwards compared to its, its neighbors, uh, we get energy split uh, between these two foci. All right. and the way I like to think about this is in terms of a traditional uh, grading. And so with the grading pattern, this is a, a blaze grading now. Um, we know that if we put light into a grating, uh, the light gets split up into various uh, diffraction orders. And we can uh, make the steps here uh, triangular and we can pick this height of these steps to be uh, one wavelength. And what happens in that case is that light coming in all goes into this plus one order. So it'll come in and it will uh, bend off into this plus one order. If we pick a height that's less than a wavelength here, the energy gets split uh, between these two orders. And uh, obviously, if we make the, the step zero, this just becomes a flat piece of glass and all the light goes straight through uh, this type of thing. And so it's really the heights of these steps that's controlling which way the light, light's going. Now, the other thing that we know from gratings is that the angle of this diffracted light depends on the spacing between uh, the the, uh, the regions here. And so for regions where we have a big spacing, uh, we get a relatively modest uh, diffraction angle here. But when these steps start to get really close to one another, that angle increases. And if we pick the progression here correctly, what happens is that we can get all these light, or all these diffracted beams to sort of converge uh, to a single point. So let's stick a lens next to this structure and so light coming in uh, because we have this uh, change in the spacing between the steps here uh, we get all the light to converge to one point here and the light that goes straight through is focused by this lens to where it would be otherwise. And if we take that pattern and we spin it 360 degrees, uh, what we get is uh, basically a diffractive uh, lens. And so now we have uh, a couple things so that we can control here. We can control how quickly uh, this progression, how, how quickly these get closer and closer together. And what that will do is shift the location of this uh, plus one order here. And then the other thing we can control is the height of these steps. 
if we make them again a step height of one wavelength, all the energy will be focused in here. And if we make them a height of zero wavelengths, if you will, make it flat, all the energy will be here. And then if we pick step heights in between, uh, we split energy between these two points. Just some variations on this theme. So uh, the apodized diffractive that I mentioned, um, the uh, spacing does what we said, but the heights of the steps gets progressively smaller and smaller as you move up. Yes? Because this is like a situation, but what happens when the lens is tilted? Is tilted? Yeah. Uh, so uh, to first. A, a continuous simultaneous image? So uh, to first order, what's, what's going to happen is that um, you're going to get some a little bit of shift between the in-focus image and the out-of-focus out image. And this is a real problem, but I think Susanna's group has actually measured lenses and you start to see sort of, what, five degree types of tilts? On and, average. Yeah. And yeah. in some cases, it actually helps because of the other Because of the other the constraints of the eye and stuff like that. So, so these tilts tend to be relatively small when we're talking about the eye. Uh, but if you were to go into other optical systems and you were to come in at big angles here, it would cause a, a fairly significant uh, issue. All right, so, uh, and then here again, it's just a picture of the apodize. So out here, there's no steps, and the height of these steps gets lower and lower and lower as you, uh, as you move uh, outwards. And so if we compare the two uh, techniques for uh, creating the simultaneous vision, we have the refractive, which is basically uh, cutting up the aperture of your lens and assigning a power to that region. And this might be you know, multiple rings or uh, pizza pie shapes or you know, swirls and stuff like that. But in general, you only have so much real estate that you can cut up and assign to one or the other powers here. Um, and then the other thing that tends to happen with these is that if you look at this, this has a small aperture. And so when you have a small aperture, have a bigger point spread function. Okay. So it doesn't mean uh, you get the sharper division. If you have these annular regions, if these are very narrow, you get a lot of depth focus out of those narrow uh, regions. And so what that tends to do is create these nice sharp rings around uh, point sources uh, for light that's, uh, that's going through there. Uh, for the diffractive, uh, you're essentially using the entire aperture of the lens for both uh, effects. And so because you're staggering these, these wave fronts, uh, you get uh, all the energy is going to distance and all the energy is going to near, and you can just modulate those, those, uh, those steps in order to kind of change the ratios between those two foci. Couple more illustrations here. So this is a uh, uh, refractive uh, multifocal with the alternating uh, powers. Uh, if you're looking at something far away, then uh, there's a, all the stuff that's going through the, the distance rings comes into focus on the retina, but everything going through the near uh, things is focusing early and then creating these nice sharp rings on either side here. And then if you look at something up close, the situation now re reverses. The near portion giving you this image here, but you get these nice sharp rings on the, on the outside here. Uh, for, this is the apodized diffractive. And so in this case, um, for a distant object, uh, mo mo most of the light is uh, getting focused to the retina here, and uh, because in the periphery here there's no uh, steps, um, that's just added energy that's being concentrated here. In the center where you have steps, uh, the energy is getting split between uh, a near focus and a distance focus. But if you look at this, there's still 
out of focus energy here, but it's not concentrated into these rings now. It's kind of smeared out over a large uniform area. And our brain has a much better, does a much better job at ignoring that uniform blur and just observing the sharp stuff than it does if you have a sharp ring around the sharp stuff that you're, you're looking at. And so it's easier to do that. And then as you bring the object up close now, this pattern essentially just kind of shifts to the right here and you have a focus on the retina and this sort of uniform uh, blur uh, around that, uh, that point. And then this one is just the sector-based uh, system where a uh, distant object through the top of the lens here, light's concentrated to the retina, but through the bottom portion, it wants to focus here and then blurs out up here. And so you have this uniform blur, but it's skewed off to, to one side. And so that's somewhere, to me, that's somewhere in the middle of the, of the two. So it's, it's definitely not as bad as, um, as the ring patterns, uh, but it's uh, it being skewed off to one side is kind of a weird effect. All right, so if we were to zoom in on a cross section uh, of uh, one of those bifocal uh, diffractive lenses, uh, what you'd see is sort of uh, these parabolic regions. Uh, and then a big uh, step uh, that occurs. And again, the spacing between these locations of these steps dictates how much power you have uh, in that lens. And then the height of uh, these steps dictates how much energy goes into uh, each one of these. And so in this case, um, I've done, this is a half wavelength uh, type of, uh, of step here and this is uh, what you need what is needed in order to split equal energy into uh, the uh, central zeroth order focus and the plus first uh, diffraction order. And that's kind of shown here. So we can think about this as uh, energy for my distance vision. Uh, this would be energy for uh, something up close, and then there's a little bit over here. Um, you get a little over 40% into each of these, so that means you get about 20% of the light that's going elsewhere. So where does that 20% go? Well, about 4% goes in here. This is light that actually diverges as it comes out of the lens. Uh, this one has about 4% in it, and it's actually light that's uh, in focus really up close here. There's only 4% of the, the light here. And if you go out a little bit further here, there's about 1% here, and there's 1% over here. And so the rest of that energy gets distributed sort of into these other uh, diffraction orders. And uh, ultimately, they just kind of lead to this out of focus blur um, that's not associated with. Uh, with one of these uh, these two peaks here. Now, trifocal lenses. So, uh, one of the complaints about bifocal lenses is you get great distance vision, you get great near vision, and then you go to use your computer, and oh wait, you got to lean in, find that spot uh, where everything's in focus. Uh, and with bifocals too, you have to. Um, you had a sort of, uh, there was a sweet spot, so you'd move around and go, oh, that's, that's where everything's nice and sharp, and you had to hold the object here. And so uh, the recent evolution of, uh, of diffractive lenses has been a move towards uh, trifocal uh, type lenses. And so in trifocal lenses, you start playing games with the step heights here. And so basic uh, trifocal has the steps in the same locations as, as you would otherwise, but you alternate the heights of these steps between uh, two different values. And what this does now is it creates a third focal point. And that third focal point's about right here where your computer is. 
and that's where you want to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so for this case, if you um, use this ratio, if this is about uh, 0.7 waves and this is about 0.3 waves, uh, what that will give you is sort of a equal energy between the three peaks. And so you get about 30% of the energy for distance, 30% uh, for up close, and 30% at some intermediate focal point uh, equals 90. You get about 10% of the light left over, and that's getting kind of split up into these other little things, about a couple percent, one percent uh, for each of those. As you play around with these various step heights, um, these plots here kind of show uh, this is uh, one, one step height versus the other step height uh, for distance, intermediate, and near. And what you find is that you can pick any point in this space and you can get different ratios of, um, of energy into the various, various focal points. And so let's say for whatever reason you want 50% in distance and 20% near, 20% intermediate, you can find a point in here that gives you the right uh, ratio of the, of the heights here. And in this space, the, uh, the bifocal type lenses are really just uh, along the uh, diagonal of these, where the two step heights are equal. Uh, between them. And so uh, by uh, freeing up that extra variable, now you have more of a space to go around and pick out uh, what types of, uh, of lenses that you want. So uh, this is a uh, uh, sort of a technus uh, multifocal, so uh, a bifocal type lens uh, with um, uh, with equal step heights, and so in this case, uh, the heights are uh, right in the middle of each of these. And so for distance, you get about 40%. For intermediate, you get zero. And for near, you get um, you get about 40%. Uh, there's another uh, bifocal uh, diffractive lens on the market called the Acrolisa, and this one it biases distance a little bit. So what they do is sort of uh, push these points a little bit this way. And so you get more energy in the distance and less energy in the near and still nothing in the intermediate to do that. And so you start playing these games of pushing around energy. Um, when you go to uh, trifocal uh, type lens, you want equal energy in each of the foci now you pick something that's off the diagonal here. So now you have two distinct step heights that you're alternating between. And in this case, you get about 30% in each of those, those foci. But really, you can pick anywhere in the space in order to get the um, desired pattern. Let's see. Um, and this just says, basically, if we shift to different points in here, we can redistribute the uh, the energy in here. Sort of following along uh, these lines here, uh, this is the panoptics uh, trifocal. And so uh, what this lens does is that it now has four different step heights, or three, I'm sorry, three different step heights. So it creates four different foci, if you will. So it's a quadrifocal lens, except that they picked those step heights in such a way so that one of those, those uh, foci disappears. So you're left with a trifocal lens uh, because one of, the, one of the foci has zero energy going to it. And what this does now is your intermediate fo focus, instead of being here, is about here. That's about where the, your computer screen is. And so it's trying to shift the location of that intermediate focus to be something that's more, uh, more functional. 
All right, so just a couple of examples here with our uh, simulations and I think you see the video. And so this is a uh, bifocal diffractive. Outside's nice and clear. There's a sweet spot right almost at the farthest point here where the phone's in focus, but you can see that the computer is out of focus. So right about there is the optimal place for the mirror. If you go to a trifocal lens, distance is in focus, intermediate's in focus, and then there's a sweet spot in here where the cell phone is in focus as well. All right, so how do we go about testing these lenses in order to try to understand uh, what they have? So um, typical setup um, is uh, the following. Uh, we'll have some sort of target here. Uh, this is obviously a, a letter chart, uh, a collimated lens, uh, a collimating lens, and this lens is actually one focal length away from uh, the pupil of the eye. We use an artificial eye model uh, for this, and so cornea and then a uh, wet cell where you can immerse one of these uh, interocular lenses in here. And uh, back here a camera, so you can record what the image looks like uh, through the lens here. And then what's nice about this arrangement is if you take this target and you move it forward or backwards, it simulates the object being at different distances. And so we can very easily look at something up close or far away and understand uh, um, how it works. So uh, it's a letter chart for a few of the different uh, technologies that I talked about here. Um, and so you, know, you can kind of see these are all diffractives up here. Uh, so the side effects associated with these are fairly minimal. But if you go to the sort of uh, refractive multifocal types of things, you start to see these out of focus uh, letters kind of superimposed on top of uh, on top of that. You can replace that letter chart with a uh, pinhole, and uh, you can start to understand uh, some of the different uh, artifacts or, that show up here, um, and so. Mainly in, uh, in this one, in this one, uh, you start to see this flare uh, that's coming off the edges here. Um, and this is really coming from, uh, coming in at an angle for a large pupil uh, and going through uh, effectively what's a diffraction grating in the, the periphery of the lens it tends to split the light up into these, uh, into these different effects. So those are really subjective type tests. You know, we can look at them and say, okay, we understand the, the side effects here, but you'd like to get some quantitative data out of here. And so uh, we want to measure the MTF of these types of lenses. And MTF, as you know, is we put in different sinusoidal targets of high contrast, but different frequencies, and we record what the contrast of uh, the output is. How do we do that with our system here? So with our system now, we're going to replace our letter chart or pinhole with a slit and uh, basically do the same uh, type of imaging now. And what we're recording is uh, the um, uh, line spread function uh, for the system. And if you uh, remember your Fourier optics, the Fourier transform of that is uh, the MTF. And so we can indirectly uh, get there. Uh, the system that we've built, uh, the artificial cornea in the eye model has about 0.27 microns of uh, Zernike spherical aberration over six millimeter pupil. Uh, so this is kind of consistent with the average spherical aberration in the, in the human eye. Um, and uh, usually we typically operate at uh, 542 
uh, nanometer. So we're usually using a white light source and just fil putting different filters in there. Could do multiple filters, but that was the easiest one to, to pull out. Here's kind of a setup of the system here. Um, and so uh, this is the illumination, uh, the doll lens, uh, and then we have a, a linear stage that can shift things, uh, cornea, and then the wet cell mounts into uh, the stage here, and the stage can be decentered left or right, or uh, rotated so that we can induce tilts into the lens. And then there's a, a recording system in the back here. That's just another uh, angle here. So this is a typical output of, uh, of one of these systems. So as you scan the slit through focus, uh, when we're at distance, the distance portion of the lens gives you uh, a nice sharp line. There's a little crud in our uh, slit here. Um, as you move to other regions, uh, both the near and distance will be out of focus and this spreads out and then as you get to the near portion of the lens We get a nice crisp line again. And so if we 4a transform each one of these it gives us a slice through the uh, Through the MTF of the system and so we can plot um, Basically the contrast as a function of object distance uh, for these types of lenses And uh, this is a uh, Example of uh, just some of these measurements here, and so uh, high contrast uh, for distance, high contrast for uh, where are you uh, uh, the expected to add uh, for the lens, but in between there's really not much going on. Now the problem with that is that uh, if you compare what people see, you measure their visual acuity uh, through focus for objects at different distances here, um, they tend to still be able to see some stuff. So in this region where MTF says we have, you know, essentially zero contrast, a couple percent contrast, people are still seeing 20, 40. And so I don't think these are the best ways to capture the performance of these lenses. But this is the way that uh, ANSI and ISO likes to um, likes to measure the performance of these. And so we're kind of stuck with these, but ideally you should be able to take this information and try to predict what these uh, defocus curves uh, should look like. What's the visual acuity the patient's gonna see if we stick this lens in the big run into the eye. All right, let's uh, shift gear a little bit from multifocal lenses to extended depth of focus lenses. And so uh, this is an example of a very cheap pair of extended depth of focus spectacles. You basically take uh, two 50 cent pieces here and you drill a teeny tiny little hole in them and it will uh, extend your, uh, your depth of focus. The problem with making small apertures is that you do indeed extend the depth of focus, but at the same time you reduce the amount of illumination going into the eye. So, so this might work uh, for uh, bright lighting conditions, but uh, under dim lighting conditions, you get this extended depth of focus, but you're kind of operating at a level that's that's really dark to, to begin with, and so chances are you're not going to going to see anything. That being said, it hasn't stopped people from employing this. Uh, this technique. And so uh, this is a uh, product that is implanted into uh, the cornea. Uh, so a flap is created in the front of the cornea and uh, this uh, opaque uh, ring is uh, placed in there and the flap is placed and, and lets it heal up. And so effectively what this is becoming is an artificial iris, okay? And it's uh, making your eye pupil seem like it's looking through a pupil that's, uh, that's this big. Now, one of the downsides of 
doing this besides the loss of light is that the performance of this is symmetrical about distance. And so uh, here's our distance, we're looking at the letter K here, and as you go on either side of this, this pattern is the same. But you can't use stuff over here, this is image behind the retina, it's far-sighted, hyperopic, uh, and so we, we lose half of our effects immediately. The other thing that you can do now is you can intentionally induce a shift, um, you know, make the person a little bit myopic with one of these rings and shift it so that you get your extended depth of focus all into a place that you can use it. The downside of that now is your, your peak performance is sort of in your intermediate range and it gets worse as you go to distance and it's worse when you come to, to near. Most people don't like that. Most people want, at the very least, crisp distance vision, and then they'll tolerate other stuff at intermediate. And, uh, okay. So, other strategies that have been used, uh, aspheric uh, type lenses, and so the idea here is to create different levels of sphere collaboration um, in the eye and in order to uh, uh, in order to sort of elongate uh, the region that uh, has a sharp focus and we can just look at uh, three different types of these are just standard um, monofocal type lenses um, and but they have different levels of sphere collaboration associated with them so uh, Technus type lens tries to cancel all the spherical aberration in the cornea and what it does is it gives you a nice tight crisp focus for distance but then very rapidly falls off on either side here. Uh, this one partially corrects some of that uh, spherical aberration but it leaves a little bit um, there and what you can kind of see is that you get a longer uh, type of focal region here, but now you start to get out of focus stuff superimposed on, on either side of it. And then uh, for this one, uh, this is kind of an extreme case where the lens itself has no spherical aberration associated with it, so it means you're getting all the spherical aberration associated with the cornea, and it stretches things out more, but it also creates more artifact. And so this will improve your depth of focus uh, but it comes at a price and what the magic number is to get that extension uh, is not, not clear. Um, it also tends to, uh, okay, so this one is just looking at, um, this one's with no sphere collaboration, so sharp, sharp contrast here, but it falls off very quickly. Uh, if you partially correct it, you start to get some depth of focus, and if you uh, turn up the um, spherical aberration knob, you can extend it even further, uh, but again, these are not huge numbers to, uh, to really give you a, a great performance. Uh, so, um, in general, you can play with uh, play with values here. Um, circle aberration tends to have a, an immediate dip uh, as you get away from distance and then it sort of comes back up uh, in about a diopter and a half of depth of field is, or depth of focus is about the best that you can do. And so what that means is that you can get from um, sort of distance to about 66 centimeters uh, with reasonable image quality, but anything in here starts to fall off very, very quickly. So you're not going to read with these types of lenses, but you may be able to see your computer and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, if we shift back to contact lenses, so most of the multifocal contact lenses these days um, sort of uh, use this spherical aberration uh, concept, but they kind of incorporate higher order uh, spherical elaboration. So this isn't your your normal Seidel type stuff, but they kind of uh, make it higher in the middle and 
and slope off uh, uh, quicker. And uh, again, this can kind of stretch things out a bit, but they're they're limited as to the uh, the near vision that they can uh, perform. Uh, for small people, uh, this progressive type of circle aberration uh, that's pretty good, but it's very strongly dependent on pupil size. And so as your pupil opens up, you start to lose uh, the effect uh, pretty quickly. If we compare um, the progressive circle aberration type thing to a ring type bifocal, you definitely get uh, uh, better image quality. Uh, with that, uh, that near, nearer stuff than you do with the, the ring type. Uh, a couple other uh, technologies that uh, I find interesting, um, you know, send the depth of focus type things. So one is the light sword. So um, this is a lens that has a pattern on it where uh, the phase changes from zero up to, uh, um, I don't know what's the best way to say this. If I take a radial section through here, it looks like the power of a lens. And so there's basically zero power in the dark blue here, and there might be a, a diopter of 50 of curvature here, and three diopters just above the horizontal here. But it's a continuous type of motion. And this one actually does kind of a nice job at uh, expanding the uh, depth of focus here. Uh, there are some artifacts where the letters seem to, depending on how far away the target is, the, they're displaced. But um, this one is certainly uh, interesting. And if uh, we model this one, um, there's definitely a, a distance intermediate and a reasonable near uh, at that sort of arm's length uh, type of, of thing with like that one. Um, another uh, technology that I find interesting, uh, this one's called an induced aperture. And so it's trying to do what that camera inlay was doing, it's trying to create a little tiny pinhole, um, but instead of blocking the light in there, it just makes everything around that pinhole up, way out of focus. And okay, so it just has kind of a weird, weird shape where in the center, uh, you have this region that's focusing the energy over the small aperture, and then everything outside of that, um, it's just so far out of focus that you can't really uh, perceive it. So it's acting like a, a small aperture without blocking uh, any of the light. I tried to reverse engineer uh, the patent a little bit and uh, some of the different parameters in here. And you can start to get uh, some depth of focus uh, going in here, but you can kind of see that the contrast uh, degrades as you expand the range of, of focus here. Um, I did, uh, I tried to optimize this effect and uh, uh, came up with a polynomial surface that, that took advantage of this effect. And if you, uh, this is just a straight lens, falls off very quickly. Down here, there's really high depth of focus uh, but the contrast is so low that you really can't see anything. If I take that contrast knob and I turn it up, you can see I get these great ear ease over a very broad range. This would be from, from reading here at 25 centimeters all the way to infinity, but there's so little energy in any one of those that I don't think it's gonna, gonna do anything. Now, those are what I call sort of true extended depth of focus uh, lenses. And so really the ideal type of uh, extended depth of focus lens would have light coming out of the lens. It would converge to a point, and then it would stay a perfect point for, for a region, and then it would expand again. 
and you're reusing that sort of straight line in the middle there. If you know how to do that, that's a uh, that's uh, worth a lot of money to a bunch of people. <laughs> um, but the lenses that I've shown you here are trying to do that type of thing. They're trying to bring taper the light down and keep it confined, confined over an extended uh, range of, uh, of, of distance. Uh, there's a couple of other uh, extended depth of focus lenses on the market um, that meet the definition of extended depth of focus, but aren't really extended depth of focus lenses in my opinion. So the first one's called the Symphony lens, and it's really a bifocal uh, diffractive lens, uh, but they've changed a couple of the, the step heights here. Uh, but in general, they have a very weak add power uh, to this, so something like 1.9 diopters. And so what that does is it basically takes your your two bifocal foci and brings them so close together that they start to merge into uh, one another. And so it has this uh, depth of focus range here, and then but if you go to a larger pupil size, it starts to fall out here. Um, similarly, here's uh, this one, the AT Lara, and you can kind of see that uh, it has these alternating uh, step heights on it. So this is a uh, diffractive trifocal lens, but again, those uh, distant, intermediate, near fo foci now are squished down so close to one another that they sort of uh, run into one another. All right, so um, just to summarize here, um, uh, there's been a wide variety of uh, refractive and diffractive strategies that have been employed to uh, create multifocal and extended depth of focus lenses. So they're really drawing on different areas of optics and trying to come up with a solution that um, gives you good simultaneous vision and mitigates some of the side effects uh, uh, with this lens. Um, and there's no ideal solution out there yet. Uh, the real next hurdle or next jump in the technology is going to be a lens that actually accommodates so a lens that actually physically changes power uh, in the eye and a lot of these side effects will will go away once you have that that being said a lot of people have been spending a lot of money for the last 20 years uh, trying to come up with such a lens and we're always five years away from from having having that lens so all right how am i on time Good. All right, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, yeah very, very interesting. Um, and yeah, you can see in the lab that there's um, lenses that we're trying that, mm. we, uh, that we design and, and think. They kind of get in, in between of some of the things that you mentioned, so yeah. it's very, very, very timely for us. Um, I have a question concerning chroma, chromatic, effect, chromatic effects, particularly mm -hmm. in diffractive optics. Mm -hmm. I mean, you very nicely showed how how the light focuses, yeah. but that's uh, that height is for specific mm -hmm. wavelength when you have more um, when you have white light. All of this is spread, yeah. and. Um, my recollection is that some people are using uh, chromatic effects to either uh, fill in the gaps, and mm -hmm. I think this is what Symphony does in a sense, that yeah. in green so light it would be bifocal, but then yeah. it would have more uh, signal in between because of the other wavelengths. Mm -hmm. And there are others, um, and this is uh, not FDA approved yet, although it's in its way, the, the, the Triumph uh, by Fisiol, yeah, that they correct. Damien's type? Yes, type thing. exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, so with the chromatic aberration, so uh, diffractive lens has an Abbey number that is opposite to um, conventional refractive optics. Uh, so it's a, actually a negative number, minus three point something. I don't know where off the top of my head. You guys should know your, right? right. Um, but uh, so basically what that says is that uh, normally with a refractive lens, the blue light will focus before the the red light and with the diffractive lens that's reversed 
And so if you put a, a diffractive lens in the eye, it actually tends to reduce the chromatic aberration of the eye. You can start to play with it uh, a little bit. I'm not convinced that it makes a huge difference, but I think the jury's still, still out. Okay. Yes? What is your opinion about the extent of AK glasses? Of, oh, the, the glasses with all the holes in it. So similar to, to what I showed here is that, yes, it will give you um, extended depth of focus. Uh, and you may be able to, to read something with it that you couldn't otherwise. But you start to go into dim lighting like this, and it's going to be hard to, hard to use. The small apertures also um, uh, limit the, the sharpness of the letter. Um, so the cutoff frequency associated with those small apertures is much lower than you'd have with a natural aperture. And so you can only get to a certain level of acuity with those, those anyway. So. Thank you for, for the talk, it was very nice. Um, talking about the EDOF, okay? Yes. Standard of focus. What is for you the definition of EDOF? I'm, I'm asking you that because, for instance, the symphony, Johnson & Johnson, mm -hmm. that for me is clear, uh, uh, by focal, diffracted by focal lens, uh -huh. they don't they say, no, no, it's not diffracted by focal. Right. They it's don't a, want to say that, ones, yeah. but for me it's clear. I read yeah. the pattern and it's, it's, yeah. it's just one, one, one and a half wavelengths so of step yeah. uh, that correct the, the, the chromatic aberration in the, in the part, mm -hmm. uh, but doesn't correct in the near. Uh, but these are deep, uh, diffracted. What, so what is the definition of uh, EDOF? Yeah, so, so part of the problem is, is that the FDA went to the standards committee and they basically dictated what a design, an EDOF design would be that you know, could get approved. And the, the, main, um, the main thing is that if you look at a, um, a visual acuity uh, versus um, distance or emergence, in uh, diopters, um, FDA wanted something that sort of monotonically falls off. Okay. And if you have a monofocal lens, it might do something like this. And there's some prescription on what this gap is. So at whatever, at two diopters, there's got to be some gap between here and you have to have sort of a continuous fall off and these have to be essentially 20-20 or better. Okay, that's that's all the FDA said. It's an eat off if you meet meet those okay. things. Okay. And so people got smart, companies got smart and said, hey if I use a really weak diffractive lens, I can get something that looks yeah. like that and meets the criterion. Then I get the name eat off. I can sell it as need off, I can make more money on it, and, and that kind of stuff. But to me, that sort of goes against the spirit of, of the name and stuff like that. Sort of what I was saying before was with an eat off lens, you really want something that sort of sort of does that. Okay? And I think we're getting to, you know, a lot of these things are sort of getting to the point where they're doing something like that. So that central core is larger than than it would be for it's not you know diffraction limit or anything like that, but it's still small enough and tight enough to give you good good performance and stuff like that. So that's where I think this stuff is heading. Um, but right now I yeah I don't think either the AT Laura or the Symphony really really meets meets the true spirit of the and which ones do you think that might uh, meet that kind of, of depth of focus kind uh, of optics? Um, so there's there's a couple of lenses that have come out, out recently. Um, so uh, one of them is called the Vivity lens, and it basically has a, uh, a surface that kind of Looks like that. 
uh, on it. And that has this kind of profile. And uh, is it iHands? I can't remember. There's another one by J&J &J that has kind of an A-sphere hmm. central type of thing. And it's, it's trying to do that type of thing. Uh, both those lenses are very, very new in the European market, and so um, I don't think the clinical data is there yet to, to basically say, oh, you know, these are great or, yeah, or not. So, yeah. Hey, listen, that the, the multifocal lenses are too sensitive to the, to the aberrations of the patient and the effect of multifocal. Do you think that the, the heat of lenses could be less sensitive to the aberrations? Yeah, so so you definitely want a nice cornea for a multifocal lens, and I suspect that the EDOF lenses are tending to do less. Uh, they look more like a monofocal with just little subtle changes on it, and so I expect aberrated patients to do better with those uh, than compared to a multifocal. The downside, of course, is that they won't get any any near. But you, you know, I think when you're picking your patients, you need to, to be very selective on on who you're picking. I have a second question. When you are designing designing the the heat of lenses, you yep. must uh, you must distribute the energy in the in the heat in the part into in, into in the linear the focal line. Yeah. What is your criteria to decide how, how many energy you, you, you put in the focal line? You'd like 100% of the energy in some, some region. So, so the, ideally the, the width of this uh, has to be narrow enough so that you can get 20-20 vision or better. Okay? And if you design it, 100% of the energy is flowing through, through that, that opening. It's not quite there yet, but um, but that's that's where you want to go with the optics. I, I mean, the luminance of the stimulus will change with decrease. The luminance of the, the the luminance of this of the stimulus in the heat of lenses could uh, be reduced because of the of the of this focal line. No, I don't think the luminance will, will be reduced at all. So if you if you get to here. All the energy is going through that channel. It's different, you know, like a, a diffractive lens. You're having <coughs> part of this, so you have a percentage of the energy here. Still, 100% of the, the energy is there, but you know, a good significant portion of that energy is is spread out over a large area. If you're truly getting this shape, you get 100% of the energy through there. Yeah. I've got a couple of questions. Uh, one is on the use for EDOF of, uh, I mean, I'm working with microscopy with extended depth of focus yep. uh, lenses and Axicon lenses. Yep. Uh, uh, yep. One, one of these I wonder if, uh, of course, Axicon, the PSF, it's, a, it's got silos, so of yep. course, that would be a drawback. But has anything been done to Axicon tonight? Yeah, so so Axicon would basically have have a profile where you have sort of this peaky type shape, um, and so what that tends to do is uh, something like that. You get this sort of region where you get high depth of focus here, but you also get a lot of stuff on on either side here. Uh, there is a Swiss company I know that was looking at this um, SAV safe. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if they ever came to market with with so anything. Depending on the angle of the uh, uh, of the axicon of the cone, it would it would, it would expand or contract that. Expand and contract. Yeah. And uh, 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 reduce the number of. Yep. Side yep. The other one was more on the of the face uh, profile of the. So you said that for um, bifocal design, that each segment is basically part of the same parabola. 
Yeah, so it's the same parabola, but it compresses at each, each step. And for a trifocal design, every second. Every other one is, is, is uh, essentially the same. And it's the same parabola times a different coefficient, uh, which would be, say, zero. Yeah, so it's got to scale up to the same, same height. But it's a parabola because that face profile. Is Some people have looked at, at doing other. I mean, basically, if you have any continuous shape in there, you'll, you'll still get a diffractive effect. And, and um, I've seen some people try to do little S-shaped S things in there, but I don't, I think it, when you get into that point, you're talking about sort of fractions of a percent, one percent types of, of differences and the bulk of it's been, been happening because of the, the stuff, so. Uh, we have some questions from the streaming. Okay. So the first one, Harold says, hello. In general, the ease of lenses in the market, Alcon or Fisio, <laughs> have the problem to the to be ahead of uh, just with frequency around 37, 40 uh, cycles millimeter. Um, knowing the frequency of the 50 or 100, do you think that do you think that can be fixed with the diffraction or with the diffraction different shape? Greg Talk, thank you so much. <laughs> so um, I didn't quite get the whole whole question there. So the, the idea is that uh, the the EDOF lenses are only looking at one frequency and not the other. It's only looking at fifty and not at hundred. Is that? Uh, that no works well with around thirty seven and forty, but yes for um, fifty and one hundred. Mm -hmm. And if do you, do you think that can be fixed with the diffraction or with the different shape? So I think with a lot of these, so, so again, it's the, it's the standards that are defining which frequencies that, that uh, are being used. Uh, but in actuality, you want to use some sort of visual acuity metric in order to extract information out of that. So um, a specific frequency misses a whole bunch of stuff because there's a lot more information in the letter and character than just that specific frequency. Uh, and we seem to be good at pulling that kind of stuff out. So you want something that uses a whole range of frequencies instead of just one or two yeah. frequencies. Probably the question relates to standards because uh, in the standards for monofocal infrared lenses, they, they yeah. are looking at 100 cycles per millimeter. Right. However, for multifocal lenses, the so standard is kind of reduced in Yeah, 50, 50 and 100. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. so eat off. I mean, it would be something in between, right? Yeah. They, they probably need the standard. For yeah, it. and and to me, I mean, those are just just numbers that manufacturers are using exactly. to hit hit a target, as opposed to something that relates to, to vision. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I also question B A being the uh, the only uh, visual metric, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you you may have a good B A, but still the vision uh, be bad because of pillows or or other artifacts. Yeah. So, and we saw that sort of early day with LASIK too. You get people who are twenty twenty, but they were miserable because they get all this other <laughs> stuff going on. So, um, Justorino say hello, uh, hi from Santiago. Uh, here, Eva has a question for you. What about cubic face profiles for either? So, uh, cubic face profiles. Um, so I think that they have uh, potential. I know in conventional optics, they've been shown to um, extend up the focus. The, the, in conventional type systems, though, they record an aberrated pattern and then use computer processing to uh, undo that effect. Uh, in the eye uh, with cubic phase, you'd get that aberrated image on the retina, and then your brain would have to figure out how to do the processing. So there wouldn't be that built-in uh, post-processing that you would normally get with, uh, with traditional cu cubic face -based. Okay, and the last one, uh, the minus um, 27 microns spherical aberration for the Technis lens mm -hmm. is peak to valley value? Uh, it is the Zernike coefficient uh, I guess what's the best way to? Yeah, yeah. So basically, basically, you'd have to have a cornea that has plus 0.27, and then you create the IOL that cancels that amount. So, uh, but there's going to be some changes as you propagate from the cornea to the IOL. Um, so it won't come out perfectly. Finding the 
six millimeters. Five point seven. Yeah, five point seven. Yes, please. Yeah. I have one more question for you. All right. Uh, what what for you would be the minimum contrast? When you, we have the, the NTF or 50 lines per minute, what would be the, the minimum contrast needed in order to see more or less? Okay. So for 2020 type stuff, I think 10%. 10%. Uh, but that being said, it's very rare that we use 20, 2020 vision for, you know, for detailed type stuff. So um, you might be able to go lower than that, but. You know, I don't know. I was I was looking at uh, some of the mini well stuff that was presented at the Wayfront Congress last year, and so if you look at the simulations there, they're sort of like these that I was showing here. Is like they're great images, but the contrast is super super low. And you had to really turn up that knob. So um, you know, five percent to ten percent, I think, would be sort of the minimum. Mm -hmm. But I I think should be at least you know, fifteen higher. There is this threshold for the visual strain um, that was, uh, I think, Robert Scanner that came up with that number, mm -hmm. point twelve, on visual strain, yeah. which integrates over. Yes, the yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. I do have a question. I mean, it's uh, it's methodological. Um, so, so your uh, series of images they were primarily taken from your. Uh, set up right like uh, the Cuban placing the yeah or um, when when you do the simulations like computer simulations mm -hmm. uh, to generate um, these um, MTS for example yeah do, do you use CMAX or you use a I mean on diffractive optics do you use CMAX or do you go for a more energy transfer uh, type of uh, programming I I have both so I have like just some custom programming that I've written where you can just put in whatever phase profile that you want and it will do you know MTF and PSF and all that through focus and stuff like that. Um, I do use CMAX, um, basically written a bunch of user defined surfaces that have the um, you know have the diffractive profiles in there uh, but you got to be careful what you pull out of there because Anything that's ray based doesn't work, but if you're pulling out things like PSF and MTF, uh, it works just fine because uh, uh, you know you're basically sampling the, the optical path difference over the exit pupil and it picks up the the pattern. Mm -hmm. so. Then we use the ray dense. Yeah, uh, just use a dense, yeah, dense thing to make sure you can hit the different norms and stuff like that. Because this is something that, I mean, from the experimental side, I mean, you see many clinicians using Harman Shack yeah. and uh, coming up with uh, conclusions on the optical quality in patients oh, yeah. with uh, it's, implanted it's diffractive mind, lenses. That... Mind-boggling. What... <laughs> 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 yeah, so, yeah, I remember Charlie Campbell, you know, we did some stuff too, but Charlie Campbell did some stuff where, you know, Shaq Hartman and the diffracted lens and the spots actually start to split into two, as you expect, because it's, you know, it's effectively a grading and stuff like that. Um, and then the other thing, Hart and Shaq basically assumes that the wavefront is smooth mm -hmm. and it doesn't have these, you know, steps in it. Mm -hmm. So everything breaks down. So uh, really you have to go to some sort of PSF-based measurement or uh, phase measurement in the pupil in order to, to mm -hmm. reliably test the quality. There is, a, there is a letter in the Journal of Catalan Practice Surgery of this month of students saying that with eight folder is not enough. Mm -hmm. So it will be totally different. The, the simulations and the points per function is totally different. Talk about the waveform, mm -hmm. just the, the waveform just uh, fitting with the eight order mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I don't know. I think you know at that point if you take two two subsequent images and you know they're going to be different by by more than that so the tear, tear films moving all over the place and yeah, that's all, so. so last question yes I'd like to know uh, your thoughts on the area under the MTF when it comes to correlate the optical quality of an intraocular lens. And the visual performance that it gives to 
Yeah, I think that's a much much better strategy for uh, correlating with with uh, you know visual performance because it's now integrating over a whole range of, of frequencies. Um, the issue there is you know what range of frequencies do you use? Um, for me, like the diffractive lenses, they always always uh, draw the MTF like this. It always uh, sort of drops from them. That it's that type of thing and diffraction limited. It's like that. But I don't believe that's that's really the MTF of, of the system because I think your brain is smart enough to just ignore that kind of scale everything up, you know, within reason. And so I think that profile is, is a much more realistic um, under under normal lighting conditions. I think I think that's a much more realistic assessment of the MTF of those lenses. Hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.